Welcome everyone. Welcome to session 10A. And these are individual papers that um, embrace the notion of traditions. And we have three presentations today. Uh, I'm going to start with um, uh, Zeynep Erdogan, but before uh, I, uh, we start with the presentation, I just want to remind folks that we will keep the questions to the end of this, this session and we'll have all speakers speak first. And please do use the Q&A module, do not use the chat. If you have a question, throw it in and I'll be monitoring the Q&A and we'll read the question out loud to each of the speakers. And if you have a specific question to a special, uh, specific speaker, please note the name, it makes it a little easier if there are a lot of questions. So thank you all for joining us. And without further ado, let's just jump into some papers. And the first one is actually a group paper. And the, um, uh, the creators were Oslan Ozgen, Ferial Sudime Ozgen, sorry, excuse my bad pronunciation, uh, Zeynep Erdogan and Sivik Arkak. But the paper is going to be read by Zeynep. And the title of the paper is From Past to Present, Henna Ritual Clothing in Anatolia an evaluation on Bindali. Welcome, Zeynep. My name is Zeynep Erdogan. Uh, I study, especially I'm interested in, in uh, traditional textile in Turkey, Turkish textile. And uh, I try to uh, explain my our, uh, presentation, our paper. Rituals, uh, which are an expression of social activity and interaction, transform participants from one status to another by uh, moving them within the symbolic space. And with these features, they are defined as expressive and emotional activities consisting of uh, sacraments, rites, ceremonies, and similar behavior patterns repeated over time. Ritual uh, as a standardized and repeated, repetitive symbolic behavior can be considered as an emotional tool that emphasizes group consciousness and unity uh, rather than individuality and a link that uh, connect in uh, the past to present for transfer of new knowledge and experiences. Transition entire rituals are activities that enable an uh, individual to transition from one status to another. Such, rit such rituals indicate social acceptance of transition or entry to uh, another status. As, a, as examples of transition uh, rituals, birth, death, and marriage rights can be considered. The marriage ceremonies shaped around various rituals and practices are considered as an important part of Anatolian traditions from Ottoman period to the present day and can be evaluated within the scope of intangible cultural heritage with these features. Henna ritual also constitutes an important part of marriage ceremonies. Henna nights are organized uh, prior to marriage. At the henna night, uh, the bride uh, wears a traditional henna dress called bindalı, usually bindalı dress, we say. Uh, the symbolic meaning of materials, colors, motifs, and embroideries used in henna clothes increase uh, the cultural importance of these clothes. The most commonly used ones at wedding and henna uh, nights are red color ones, especially dark red color ones. Uh, these garments made of silk uh, or cotton velvet or satin fabric are used in wedding ceremonies in Anatolia and are embroidered with patterns created using uh, golden color and silver color threads and accessories such as headgear, headwear, uh, belts are used to complete the clothes. Uh, 
Henna entertainment, which is a tradition that has been forgotten, uh, especially in cities due to the uh, changes in daily life practices, has regained it, its old importance in social life uh, with the effects of cultural production system in recent years. The Henna night ritual is important in terms of preserving and maintaining in uh, the intangible cultural heritage. The intangible cultural heritage continues to exist within the tangible cultural heritage. At this point, it becomes important to examine how the intangible cultural heritage adapts to changing context and transforms itself. Semiotics, uh, which is based on principle or meaning making uh, with symbols, was chosen as the method of this study in order to analyze the tradition and ritual associated with it. In terms of semiotics, so society functions as both the coding, in other words, transmitting and the transmitted element of communication, which opens and interprets the code. Society codes messages for the continuation of relations with other societies for the transfer of culture to new members. Uh, signs are shaped in two main axes uh, as signifiers and signifiers, while two, these two planes are important for the sign. Uh, Sciures doesn't advocate the necessity of direct link between the signified and signifier. The traditional Henna clothes, which show regional differences in terms of model, cut, fabric, and embroidery, appear uh, as a research object to see uh, the rela relationship between cultural semiotics. Uh, Bindalı dresses from Ankara, uh, Beypazar region, and uh, contemporary Bindalı dresses used in henna ceremony held in the same region this year are used uh, as the analyzed material in the study. Yes, uh, I uh, I talk about uh, about uh, content of bindalı. It is mostly described as a, a garment or cover with embossed branches, leaves, flowers, embroidered with metal 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 threads on purple velvet in, uh, in the T Turkish dictionary, and Çelebilik and uh, Çengel uh, describe. Bindalı dresses, which take their name uh, from uh, embroideries with a rich composition, consisting of especially plant motifs spread uh, from Istanbul to Anatolia and used as engagement and bridal wear. Arla and Yanar described Bindalı as dresses, shalwar, tree skirt, covering materials which are various motifs, especially plant, writing, objective, geometric, uh, are embroidering using metal threads and divide work on velvet. Uh, you see uh, bindal dresses and covering material. It's uh, taken from Ankara Ethnographia Museum. Uh, on the uh, left, uh, picture, uh, bindal the dresses, uh, well, uh, 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 satin uh, fabrics or atlas fabrics and embroidery, uh, marash embroidery or dival embroidery you see, and a pink color fabric and purple color uh, uh, atlas fabric. Uh, on the right uh, picture, a covering material and embroidery, uh, marash embroidery technique uh, is used on this uh, fabric. Uh, yes, Kochu and Özen describe Bindalı as uh, an uh, old name, 
uh, old uh, fabric name. Silk fabrics and velvets uh, are embroidered using gloves, uh, a kind of uh, metal thread, and uh, large leaves branches. Also, Kuchu, Kuchu reports that this cloth often cuts from entirely mintan used by but, uh, both women and men, especially young craftsmen, were wearing Indali in the past. Uh, I uh, I try to explain Maraş embroidery techniques uh, special uh, properties uh, are. Maraş embroidery techniques is now by names such as divay technique, simsirma work, metal thread uh, work, cardboard cardboard work, compression work as well. Uh, Maraş technique applied by mutual listening with uh, multiply uh, and thread from top and waxed yarn from the bottom. And in, in past cotton, cotton uh, leather, cardboard were used. Today, cardboard, fabric, hard leather are used fling material. Uh, some properties of bindalı dress or covering uh, material, usually velvet fabrics and uh, other fabrics, atlas or tafta, uh, fabric color, you mostly dark red, right? Uh, color, uh, and then purple color in especially Bay Pazarı district, uh, very common these uh, colors. Uh, barrage embroidery techniques were important, and or divar embroidery technique. Uh, metal thread as embroidery thread, golden color and silver color. Plant uh, motifs, object geometric uh, motifs uh, as well. Uh, it uh, applied on the uh, material, on the uh, fabrics, and embossed motifs, leaf motifs. We see plant motifs. Uh, you can see uh, photograph by Arla uh, and uh, flower motifs and uh, leaves motifs on uh, the uh, velvet fabrics. And uh, these uh, photographs from Bay Pazarı, you see uh, on the uh, uh, left picture, uh, the dark red uh, velvet uh, fabric, and uh, divide or marash work embroidery techniques and um, very common, uh, very intensive motifs, especially on the right picture, uh, on the right uh, dresses, uh, inter uh, motif intensive, we can see very rich uh, in, in this picture. Uh, this is a very old picture. Uh, all of uh, the these women uh, live in Bay Pazar, uh, I think, and uh, all of them wear uh, bindala dresses and uh, also wear uh, metal belt. And uh, maybe you can see uh, divar or uh, maraş embroidery techniques, and they have head scarves. Uh, this uh, on the left uh, picture, a uh, bindalı dress, a uh, henna dress, we say, and uh, also um, uh, dark uh, red uh, velvet and uh, very intensive uh, varash work, varash um, embroidery uh, technique we see, and also we see uh, red scarves. Very important thing, uh, henna dress, a part of henna dress, a red uh, scarf uh, and head dress, uh, headwear uh, in the uh, model we see. Uh, on the le uh, right picture, uh, purple uh, velvet uh, and inten motifs of, uh, intensive motifs are very rich uh, in this. Uh, Windal dresses. 
Uh, this dress uh, has two pieces, uh, coat and shalvar. A shalvar is uh, a kind of uh, uh, woman and man clothing material um, item. And as you see, uh, a silver uh, belt you see, and uh, dark red uh, velvet, and uh, also we see uh, embroidery materials. Uh, also, we see a red scarf in this picture. Uh, Bindalı dresses, also this uh, taken, uh, this picture taken from Ankara Ethnographia Museum, different color you see, uh, an atlas uh, or satin uh, fabric, and uh, I think you can see uh, embroidery motifs, plant motifs, especially uh, flower uh, and uh, some branches. Uh, in uh, can seen, and on the right uh, photograph, uh, older woman wear wears uh, bindalı, and uh, especially similar to uh, bin, uh, Ankara uh, and uh, Beypazarı uh, ones or Beypazarı dresses. These are uh, new uh, design uh, bindalı dresses in recent years. Uh, in this slide, you see new design uh, samples of bindalı, different color, but uh, dark color, as you see, uh, different uh, color embroidery, especially on the left uh, picture, you see, uh, different uh, color uh, embroidery uh, threads and new embroidery patterns you see uh, uh, different uh, motifs and new design headdresses new design belts uh, uh, most of them uh, fabric uh, made from fabric uh, are getting increasing among young women. Young, some young women would like to wear the bindalı dress at her henna night. Uh, and uh, all of uh, the bindalı dress uh, has uh, machine made uh, Marash embroidery work. Uh, from the, the point of uh, that uh, view that culture can be preserved by keeping it alive, it is thought uh, that it is important to examine how henna entertainment, clothes and accessories, which have existed in Anatolian culture for centuries, uh, have come from uh, the past to the present, how they uh, have adapted and changed in terms of preserving natural values and continuing them by passing them on the uh, future generations, examining and understanding the relationship between culture, ritual, and semiotics, the uh, transformation of Bindalı, which is a henna uh, entertainment dress over the years, fulfill all the purpose of contributing to the studies of the tradition from different fields. Fashion uh, plays an important role in the creation of the cultural meanings and in uh, transferring these uh, meaning to users. And it is possible to spread local values to wider geographic geographies through the spatial systems. In recent years, the fact that middle-like clothes have been presented with different design and dresses or beachwear that uh, can be worn over swimsuits shows that the area of use has expanded. This can be considered as an example of sustainability discussion, 
discussions on the subject and creativity uh, and being open to innovations and also have sustain cultural place values and prevent corruption. Thank you for uh, attention. Um, our next speaker is Sude Dadras, and the title of her talk is Presence of the Past. Welcome. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Sude Dadras, and I am an artist curator and MFA student in textiles at Georgia State University at Georgia. I'm going to share my uh, screen with you, and uh, thanks to Zaina for giving a really good introduction to henna use uh, in Turkey, because uh, Iran and Turkey also are having um, lots of uh, same traditions and customs. So it was really useful uh, to uh, attend to her talk. Um, the list of figures are coming at the end of the uh, presentation. So if you have any questions, let me know. Beauty and beautifying. Uh, for humanity's desire for beauty is one, one clear reason why we decorate our surroundings. For centuries, people and communities have used available resources to beautify their bodies and lives and, and um, uh, demonstrate the appreciation of nature, life, and uh, social and medical powers. In early communities, beautifying the body for showing their appreciation and respect to their surroundings and nature was among the most important rituals. As you see in the photo, it's a, she is a Kurdish woman uh, that um, have uh, permanent tattoos on her neck and chin and, her, uh, and also her face. The most common forms of body art uh, are body painting, tattoo henna or uh, temporary tattoos, uh, body piercing, scarifications and uh, branding, uh, which they are practicing actively in many of the African and also some of the tribals in uh, Middle Eastern communities uh, even uh, today. Body art and identity. Um, decorating bodies in different communities plays an, in, uh, an identification card role. In most of the tribal communities, uh, having a, uh, a specific body art, especially on the female body, discloses the age, the marriage status, the background of family uh, the person belonged to, and what a stage of life the person it is. For example, uh, when a, a young girl turn into five, they have very special type of scarification in the forehead uh, in some communities and other um, adding more when a, a lady become a widow on the uh, palms, on the arms and uh, under the stomach. For example, in some African tribal communities, scarification is a ritual pregnant woman uh, to encourage them for getting ready for a new role as a mother. Uh, as you see in the photo, um, there are obvious um, marks that a professional person use a needle to go under a skin and twist it. And uh, the blood uh, that gathers there leave the permanent mark on the stomach. Body art in Muslim communities. Uh, changing the uh, natural look, uh, form and appearance of body is considered forbidden in Islam. There is no specific Islamic verse outlining the point, but many people believe wuzu, uh, the uh, purification ritual before prayers cannot be completed if you have body art in your skin. So any type of the permanent mark is um, banned and uh, uh, forbidden by um, the Islamic uh, law and Sharia. But, but um, in the future slides, I will show you how females especially uh, add their creativity to demonstrate their love of design and uh, respect of the nature by using henna as a temporary tattoo forms. Finding comfort in henna. Using ephemeral body um, art such as henna or temporary tattoo become very popular uh, since using permanent tattoo and uh, another type of permanent body arts banned in Muslim societies. People in Muslim communities use henna to decorate their bodies in many occasions. For women, henna application became a proper way uh, to, uh, to tell their stories. They draw fine geometric and organic lines, flowers, figures, and other motifs to let their sorrow and pain go away. Also, um, that is stated, uh, the entering to the society, getting married, giving life to another, uh, ple pleasing gene, which is a very spiritual uh, element in some of the 
Muslim communities, uh, ensuring building and uh, preventing illness and uh, misfortune, but writing verses, uh, holy verses from Quran or other uh, Islamic verses on piece of fabrics and carrying them away uh, with you um, in entire your life to prevent your uh, self and families from harm. Henna usage in body art and more. Henna is a perfume syrup with a white blossom and has been used for thousands of years among Muslim and non-Muslim cultures to dye fabrics and letters. In, uh, it has also been used as ink uh, to write Quranic texts and uh, talismatic shirts. Henna painting uh, is an um, interact part of the ancient Iran's mythology. Ancient Iranians believe uh, that henna was a plant given to them uh, from paradise. Therefore, they believe it had magical and protective power. A person who apply henna, a specialist, uh, to their bodies uh, uh, would enjoy happiness, integrity, and fortune. They would also uh, protect it from the evil eye and gather a place uh, in heaven, and guaranteed uh, a place in heaven. Sorry, my face. <laughs> Clearly, henna application serves more than a cosmetic function. Uh, the practice has become uh, woven into local tradition. Children from families who gather for traditional Islamic rites or uh, passages uh, to see henna decoration on the bodies of grown-ups at both weddings and funerals. In this miniature, you see a very old use of henna and the palms and hands of these two ladies. Um, this um, piece is kept in the Harvard University Museum. They say uh, countries are good for innovation. Born and raised in Urumia, the capital of West Azerbaijan province in Iran, I saw how women in my community were always thinking of creative ways to bring peace, happiness, and deep satisfaction into their loved ones and their lives. My childhood passed by watching women who fought selflessly for they and uh, other females' basic rights, their passion, uh, in the, their, their position in the society, and what they want to achieve. These women later come together to work on their needleworks, uh, weaving rugs, and decorate their bodies with henna. Even though they knew they are going to keep the, uh, the decoration, the decorated part of their bodies under um, the thick uh, layers of clothing, uh, because uh, in Islamic rules, uh, women cannot uh, show their bodies and uh, display the design on their bodies publicly. So they use that to tell the stories and the pain and uh, all the experiences that they went through um, through that designs. Henna art in Iran, more than a cosmetic function uh, it played uh, and had a place in mythology and ancient Iran. Henna is a gift of paradise, as I said before and um, um, stated before, and it brings happiness, integrity, and fortune uh, in people's life. Uh, in this uh, miniature, belongs to Qajar era, you, you see a, a musician, mostly um, the ladies in the Qajar paintings are dancers, musicians, or performers. But um, women of um, the kings or um, high prestige uh, army members, they never had a chance or they never had the right to show their faces or their body parts. And um, that's why I'm going to explain more uh, how I become interested in uh, the talismatic shirts. As you see in this picture, they used to wear layers and layers on, um, under the uh, actual uniform. This is an image of the Mazani um, traditional henna market in Gaz province in Iran. And they are creating henna out of the henna syrups for years and years. Um, the henna created in that uh, workshops are the most purest uh, type of henna that I find during my uh, travels around the world. And um, they are actually also in, in, introducing um, very ancient ways of mixing henna with water, herbs, uh, oils, and um, other uh, ingredients to make it uh, better uh, and adding more soothing and healing uh, performance to it. The other use of henna um, and uh, decorative uh, uh, use of use of it, as I mentioned before, was uh, decorating the uh, burial or uh, textile pieces. In these pieces, you can see a tiraz, a very old Egyptian part that they use in um, covering 
the deceased body and then uh, putting it in a grave in an Islamic era, of course. And over here in the top, you will see two new uh, products. Um, they are uh, been in the market for a couple of years now in Iran. They are using mostly henna to create uh, and write the verses in uh, both Nasalik and uh, Iranian Nasalik uh, writings. Um, these are later my findings in museums around the world, and I saw how um, uh, artists use these talismanic shirts, henna, and other colors uh, to design these beautiful, uh, very meaningful clothing that kings and uh, people in the armies wore under the um, uh, uniforms before the war or very special meetings. But also in some societies, female also use uh, to wear this to protect their body, especially when they were pregnant to uh, keep their child away from the negative thoughts and uh, bad wives. As, um, one, uh, as I uh, mentioned before, I wanted to show you how in Iranian um, uh, civilizations and uh, societies, people used to wear layers and layers of the clothing. This is uh, the king, uh, Fat Ali Shah. He is wearing uh, a, a dress made uh, especially for him, full of the jewelries and stones and um, uh, diamonds and uh, rings. And um, as you see in the part uh, over here, um, I can uh, see, I can recognize two layers here and one layer under. But also in the dancers and performance clothing, you see they have layers and under under um, clothing uh, under uniform they are. Uh, dancing with. And um, th this is an angel design that you see another uh, underwear or uh, that type of the talismatic um, t-shirt with uh, verses on it. Um, sorry, I couldn't find a very clear photo of it to um, displays. Uh, but also um, in these images, I wanted to show another kind of the underwear. Uh, it, it was really fascinating coming across it. Um, the next image. Um, over here, I uh, am showing you two of my uh, pieces I created recently, uh, inspired by the talismanic shirts. I'm uh, using mostly uh, just the design, but I'm approaching to the theme as a researcher in the same time as an artist and maker. So I use all the time the discarded material and fabrics to create my pieces and um, the simple uh, running stitch is the main material in my studio practice. I'm adding uh, different uh, textures and uh, verses from Quran and also uh, po uh, poems from um, uh, Ferdowsi, which was a very old, uh, high respected uh, poet in Iran. Uh, this is the oldest piece I made and I uh, try to use uh, Japanese uh, also techniques in uh, patching my pieces on top of each other and um, creating a form that uh, also reminding me of that talismanic shirt. What I use um, in creating these pieces uh, after uh, applying for the, uh, the this symposium was um, actually going through so many hard uh, events in my life uh, as a Iranian as an Iranian immigrant and having uh, so many devastating uh, uh, news and bad events happen in Iran. I tried to uh, start adding each stitch in the name of uh, the people who died in the uh, airplane crash uh, to uh, my uh, talismanic shirts. I know they are gone, but I tried to uh, add uh, their names to preserve them, their memory. Uh, in my uh, works. I'm, add, I'm using um, my loved ones and my friends' hair that they donated to me in creating these uh, stitches uh, to add more meaning and uh, make it more personal. Uh, and I will continue creating these pieces uh, and uh, let's see how uh, my art journey and my um, research is going to go uh, forward. Thank you for uh, at, for joining to my talk. And if you have any question, I'm here to answer. Um, yeah. Uh, we have one more talk today in this uh, panel. Um, our next speaker is Regina Meredith Fitiao. And the title of her talk is Making 
Siapo in Leone today. And I do want to add that um, Regina was nominated for the Founding Presidents Award. So please welcome Regina. Good morning, everyone. It's around, it's a little after seven here in Pongo Pongo American Samoa. And I'm sorry if you hear chickens crowing and noise in the background. I try to make sure everybody was well away and far away, but excuse me if you should hear a few roosters crow. <clears throat> Making Siapo and Leone today. American Samoa is known as Tutuila, and it is one of nine Samoan islands located in the South Pacific. It became an unincorporated United States territory in 1900, and although it has many modernized ways, Tutuila perpetuates its living rich culture. One component of cultural practice that has endured in, is Siapo. And this is just to show you a few of our island scenes here. Siapo is the ancestral art of bark cloth painting. I am a fourth generation Siapo maker from the village of Leone on Tutuila Island and making Siapo has continued to be the backbone of my art fabrication today. The Siapo makers of old, along with the use of each material together, continue to inspire my creativity and the desire to pass on this traditional knowledge to the next generation. This presentation is an elucidation of my work as a traditional Siapo maker and a contemporary artist. My thoughts and observations about Siapo is divided into three areas of focus. First, Siapo from the standpoint of an artist journeying through the process of fabrication and motif utilization on cultural and contemporary levels. Second, looking at Siapo in the educational arena. And third, interacting with the outside world, sharing it, sharing what I know while attempting to perpetuate it as my ancestors did. I'm showing you here that there are two methods of bark cloth painting and bark cloth creation. This one is called siapo tasingna, which is a rubbing method where a board is actually carved. In the old days, they used to sew them. And then the bark cloth is rubbed on top and then they're highlighted with natural dyes. The second one here that you see is called siapo mamanu. This is a freehand design where the bark cloth is laid uh, laid out flat after it's been processed. And the siapo maker then tends to the painting of the mamanu, the patterns onto the bark cloth. I remember my siapo master, the late Auntie Mary J. Pritchard. She used to say to us, e ke ulava e le ua na mea. the ua takes care of its own. This saying has had the greatest impact on me now more than ever. The entire method from bark cloth processing to a finished painted bark cloth has ingrained in me a deeper appreciation of my ancestors and the physical hard work needed to create these works. My understanding and respect for each of the natural materials used to create Siapo are valuable gifts, gifts from the vow, the forest, and one must nurture them and respect them using only what is needed. What I remember first about Siapo when I was young was not the mamanu, the motifs and the patterns on the bark cloth, but the smell, the smell of the dyes being used to paint them. I'm just gonna show you this little clip here. Especially the pungent smell of squeezed bark scraped beans of the O'a brown dye. This dye, is the main dye and its scent is a cross between a wholesome clean smell and a musty dank smell. There's nothing that compares to it. But despite its powerful scent, it is the ua, the paper mulberry that has become the most significant material for me personally. I'm just gonna show you because I'm going to walk through my vow. This is a, a patch of my paper mulberry here. My perception of Ua includes the growing and maintaining of a patch of trees 
and then harvesting, peeling, cleaning, scraping, beading, and drying it to a finished piece of paper mulberry. The patience, nurturing, and handling of the ua is crucial because it is our natural canvas. <clears throat> On it will be inscribed the ancestral patterns and motifs that have been a part of our identity for centuries. Siapo is utilitarian and its purpose includes ceremonial presentation and dress, clothing, shrouds, uniforms, and coverings or dividers for the home. When I decided to return back to ua making, because for a while there, I was just really painting the ua, making the siapo mamanu, and really sort of skipping over the actual processing. So when I decided to go back to really getting back to basics and go to the grassroots level, I spent a lot of time with this woman here that you see in the, in the photographs. This is Toa Iva Mulipola. And she helped me to just to, to re-familiarize myself with it, especially when it came to con the conditioning step. I forgot how backbreaking it was to make uh, you have to sit cross-legged on the ground with a papa valu oa, I'm, I'm sorry, papa valu ua, leaning against a pole or a wall in front of you. And you continuous, continuously pour water and it's, you're scraping using a shell until it is clean of its debris before you start to beat it. So I thought she used to laugh at me and she'd say that I was too skinny and you know that, that it was too much work for me, but somehow that together we would endure. And I always have appreciated being with her and spending time with her. To the left, you'll notice that there is a, uh, the left photograph rather, is a, a, a picture of the ua being separated from the outer bast or the outer, the outer core of the tree. <clears throat> Regarding design and motif utilization, I decided for this paper that I would select three examples of some of my current work that would help to exemplify tradition and also contemporary components. There's undeniably traditional factors in the work, but also I thought that it would also show my influence that is outside of tradition. Probably the most contemporary is self-portrait, the one here. In 2007, I had a chance to showcase in, in two group shows back to back one of them being called Island Affinities. I decided that I wanted to make a Siapo Mamanu, but it broke away from tradition, mainly because of the inclusion of collaged images of specific photographs and family names. Using the Oa brown dye, I inscribed four family names, Puletu, Tuimalea Lifano, Tsokmalatai, and my mother's name, maiden name, Pena. They were applied with our natural brushes, the Paongo, I also included the name of my father and his chiefly title at the time, Atu Elevao. I put a coordinate of a piece of land. I placed images of my family and my brother and things that I held very dear to myself. I knew that it was very contemporary in my approach to this work. Lastly, on a large plexiglass pane separate from the Siapo, I painted a portrait of partially of my face in black. Its placement, shielding the siapo from view, requires the viewer to look closer, attempting to see everything. This partial view of seeing and not seeing defined my identity at that point in time. The passing of my father, who for me was the direct link to my Samoan heritage, was devastating. <clears throat> I had unanswered questions about family and our culture, about language and protocol. And the source for this knowledge would physically no longer be there for me. The motif called Fa'a Atualoa, the centipede, which refers to hardship and long suffering, framed both the top and bottom of the Siapo. It was perfect for this piece, but I was hesitant to send self portrait to the exhibitions. I had doubts. Was I overstepping my boundary with traditional Siapo? Was I using this traditional art form for my own gain? Did I have the right to manipulate its surface? Would this piece become an open door for others to exploit the use of Siapo? And this questioning and hesitancy, hesitancy rather, 
finally came to a head after discussing my plight with my aunt, the late Marilyn Pritchard Walker, Auntie Mary's daughter, who I spent an enormous amount of time with. She lovingly gave it her blessing and she reassured me. She reassures me by saying that despite any contemporary influences, the Siapo would have the ability to withstand and maintain itself, period. End of discussion. I sent it to the exhibitions. It was well received. I was so thankful. In fact, I didn't even expect some of the some of the comments that were made, such as the one that uh, Dr. Bernita Webbender said in that the work being described as uniting two aesthetic and formal traditions in the contemporary context of modernity, transnationalism, globalization, and other conditions of being in our time. I just didn't expect that. And I was so thankful that um, I still had the guidance of some of the master tapa makers, especially Auntie Marilyn. Another work, and this is my second example of, of how the work looks presently for me as, a, as an artist and a Siapo maker. In 2018, I received a commission for a Siapo to be integrated into a large glass conference table being fabricated for a govern, government director's office. I created a Siapo Mamanu, the freehand method, and I used all the formations of tradition as would be needed. The installation of the conference table into its space was probably the most difficult part of this commission. But once everything was set into place, as you see the photograph there of the gentlemen that are placing this large glass into place on top of this Siapo, it looked handsome for the director's office. But the piece for it, for me, defined the versatility of the art form because it reflected a presence an, aus, an, awareness, an awareness rather of cultural identity and values. It was where important decisions were going to be made by dignitaries. It confirmed that Siapo is utilized outside of its ceremonial purpose during a sua, during the bestowal of a chief's title. And it also represented cultural value in a modern way. My third example of work that I've been presently doing here, and Leone, in Leone, we have basically two Siapo makers right now, myself and my husband, Su'awili Sone Fitiao. We are active Siapo makers right now. My third and final example of my work is Oleolama Ilitemine, Living in the Now. <clears throat> it's the making of Siapo face masks. As I write this paper, both Samoa and American Samoa do not have any COVID-19 cases. But despite this fact, as an artist, I am so compelled. And I, through these mask making, I reach out to safeguard others. I started making these masks made of siapo. They're two ply as any siapo would be made. But now I sew them and I put a backing, which is made of cotton. And I put elastic bands, as you see there. This is just a few examples. I've been, I had planned only to make a series of 59 because at the time I was 59 years old, but somehow through popular demand, I am still making these masks. I think I have now made close to 200. Each one is different in design and painted with ancestral patterns. They reflect the thought processes of my ancestors ancestors who define their world and define ours today. Their management is to be worn occasionally. They're not the equivalent of an N95, but they're placed in the hot sun for lengths of time. They are managed just like we would in tradition. When we go to air out our siapo, we take them outdoors to, to grab the sun, to heat them, to warm them, to, to sterilize them. This ongoing project has made me feel connected to the outside wor world. I, I felt like I needed to do something rather than to sit idle and do nothing. I now turn to Siapo in the educational arena. 
After presenting a paper at a conference in Adelaide, Australia, entitled Art Education in Samoa, this was around 1992, I realized that our higher education art courses focused only on, or basically on, Western concepts. And so it, it inspired me to create an art class called Indigenous Art Forms of Samoa. Today, this course is probably the most popular of all the art courses offered at the American Samoa Community College. Recently, the National Park of American Samoa announced a request for proposals to help perpetuate Samoan traditions by teaching traditional practices. I submitted a proposal and we were awarded funds to support the continuation of Art 161. Right here, as you're seeing, there are students who are in class in, that are enrolled in this actual class. And this project, we're creating a Siapo Mamanu that is eight feet by eight feet square. It's the project lead is Sua Wilisone Fitia, who's also a student of the late Auntie Mary J. Pritchard. There are many of us. Some of us are still active practitioners. Others have decided not to continue Siapo, but it has been a win-win situation where all involved are helping to fulfill the mission of perpetuating Samoan traditions through education and outreach. Engaging with students of all ages is important to me. Oftentimes after school, when children get a chance to do our activities, they come to the Boys and Girls Club of American Samoa. And I love, I love to see the children take a look at the Siapo to see what it feels like, to try to hold the brush, to do the best that they can. And I always hope to establish a love with them in the cultural arts, learning the language, the vocabulary that is associated with the art form. <clears throat> in my work, I've, I've interacted with the world outside of American Samoa, contributing to the dialogue of bark cloth fabrication and care in museums has become an important part of the journey to venture abroad and share Siapo is an honor for me, especially as a representative of our, of our island. Dr. Adrian Kepler, Curator of Oceanic Ethnology at the National Museum of Natural History, Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC, had invited me as a community scholar for the Wilkes Tapa project she coordinated at the NMNH in 2013. We worked closely with a team of conservators stabilizing tapa collected during the United States Exploring Expedition of 1838 to 1842. It was really a great, a great, I learned so much. It was just a wonderful endeavor. And then more currently, tapa situating Pacific bark cloth in time and place at the University of Glasgow has been the most current collaboration to date, sharing Siapo with others. We got to work with collab, um, sorry, conservators, both my husband, Suo Willi Sone and I, showing them how to, from start to finish, create a piece of bark or to process a piece of bark and then to paint, to create a Siapo Mamanu. And then lastly, what was so wonderful being on that most recent trip of, of uh, 2018, was getting to see a Siapo Mamanu that was made from my village. It's dated around circa 1897. To get to see it, to see that there was a name inscribed on it and to, to just be in close contact meant so much to me because I knew that the women of my village, the women of our country were very much into making Siapo. It is an honor to to make this art form. The ua takes care of its own. I understand that now as I've gotten older. It has been proven tried and true, bringing me full circle, and I intend to keep making it. Thank you so much. I just wanted to provide some resources for you. There's some websites there of some of our some of the things that are actively going on regarding bar cloth. And I wanted to thank so many, everyone here, and especially the uh, hidden, hidden Stories, Human Lives. Thank you so much, the Textile Society of America. Thank you so much, Regina. I'd like to have all the panelists come back on and you can unmute. 
Okay, it's actually, this is for Zainab and Sude. Are the henna motifs that are drawn on the skin repetitive with the designs in the embroidered textiles? We as Iranians, we don't have um, the textile motifs uh, incorporated in, like uh, we don't have that uh, in our textile motifs creation. So that is something originally uh, belongs to Turkey. And uh, I think Zainab is the right person to ask the question too. But in Iran, we usually um, like uh, female, uh, females and uh, woman practitioners, they use uh, all the organic designs because using the figurative uh, design, animal figures are banned uh, after Iranian uh, accepted to uh, uh, live in Iran and started practicing in Islam. So using the figurative designs were um, really restricted until maybe the last uh, 100 years ago. Uh, so Turkey uh, have and um, has the really deep uh, culture and uh, history on it. Um, Zainab, um, when were the um, first Bindali dresses manufactured and where? Uh, I think every woman uh, embroidered and uh, stitch these uh, dresses in uh, her home. Uh, usually, I think, I don't uh, exactly know. Okay. Uh, place, uh, for example, in uh, a woman live uh, in Beypazarı uh, uh, and uh, in past, uh, they near the Ankara and uh, maybe some uh, or uh, some women make uh, embroidery, some people uh, stitching all these uh, uh, dresses, I think. Okay, great, thank you. Do you understand? I, yes, I mean. <laughs> yes. Um, I have another question for Sude. Are the motifs and symbols on the talismanic shirts for pregnant women and the ones for men different? Yes. Are they made by the same makers? They are completely different. In uh, King's uh, workshop, they mostly uh, designed and created the talismanic shirts for the male uh, party, and they were always carry the meaning and uh, verses regarding to their health and the uh, victory in the wars, in the meetings, and how to uh, govern the country. But in females, uh, talismanic shares, they are talking mostly about the uh, woman health and the well-being of the fetus and the baby to be born and uh, how they um, could and should be more uh, like God be a woman uh, and coping with the hardships of their lives. Even the symbols and designs are uh, related to the, those, those verses and uh, textures. Great. Um, I have a question, I actually have two questions for Regina. Um, the first one is, did learning to make your own mulberry paper change your artistic practice or the appearance of your work now? No. Be when we were children, we were, we were taught to do siapo start to finish. But I, as I got older, I had so many other things that I was doing, right? I'm going to school. There's just so much going on. So I sort of like, I overstepped it, but coming back to it, it just made, it grounded me. I think that would be probably one thing. It grounds me. It just, I have a higher regard for what I'm doing. It, because the process is a lot of work, but it humbleizes. It, it makes you humble. You know, you appreciate it. And just when I think, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, you know, eat some bark, go cut the uh, and you know, do that, and then I'm gonna go do something else. It's an all-day thing. So there's a real respect for it now, and I don't think it's necessarily changed my art per se, but it has in my attitude towards it. I've had, I have a higher regard and respect for it. Um, uh, these next, you had two questions about this, and I want to join in on this one too. Your masks are amazing and wonderful. Oh, thank are you, you selling them? And where can I we am. get them? <laughs> I still am. You know, I make them with love because I—it's my way of of 
reach, I make, everyone is different. I'm almost up to 200 now and people just message me or Facebook, you know, social media, or they'll email me. And then I, I get them made. So they're, they're not sitting around. They're like, I make them and then I send them. So if there's anyone interested, please let me know. Well, that's great because everyone can contact you directly via um, our Com Crowd Compass app. So you're going to get deluged, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm actually, um, yeah, I'm trying to, it's become a project. It really has. I think I'm on series four sets of 60 because now I'm 60. And it just kind of keeps it where I can manage a set of them at a time. But I make them thinking about who is going to wear this and you're, you're, they become shields, like we're warriors going into battle. That's great. Um, question for Zainab. Um, yeah. Are the Bindali dresses worn by urban women in Anatolia? What do rural village women wear on their henna night? No, no. Uh, uh, both of them. Uh, both. Yes, both of them, uh, especially in uh, rural, in rural, as is very common uh, dresses, and uh, in urban urban uh, places are uh, like uh, especially some young women would like to wear the bindal uh, dress at her henna night, especially uh, we, uh, they. Uh, like uh, getting getting increasing this station. There was a, an addition to this question um, asking about particularly the Aegean region, and and that would be the same. They still wear that on henna night. Yes, uh, I, I repeat. I was just saying um, there was a last bit to that question that um, in the Aegean region also of Turkey, do they yes. do that? Every region we Every can region. Uh, right. find uh, these dresses, but different color, different motifs, and different uh, models. Uh, we can, but uh, usually every region of Turkey we can find, uh, mm -hmm. especially every museum, uh, city museum, we can find uh, uh, this type of uh, this type of dresses. Hey, um, I have a question for Sude and Regina. This is an interesting question um, from Vida Plume. Uh, both um, Sude and Regina have researched, but also live within their cultural traditions. Uh, using these traditions as artists involves pushing and challenging these traditions. This can be both exciting and scary. Can you talk about some of your thoughts and experiences pertaining uh, to this? Regina, you go first, please. Oh, <laughs> thank you for the question. Yes, you know, one of the things, as you saw with my self-portrait, you know, I question myself how, you know, where, where am I overstepping, am I disrespecting? And, you know, to, to get, you know, to go through that process, you know, I, when we get called to do ceremonial siapo, let's say for a wedding or a funeral, the bestowal of a chief's title, those things are so important and they are completely immersed in tradition, the, the formation of tradition. And then as an artist, you know, I have always been mindful or have tried to be mindful of the way in which I manage the art form because I never want to disrespect it. And so when I teach it, I ask my students to think those things too, because it's important. Our ancestors, you know, Auntie Mary used to say, play with your patterns, see what you come up with. But then there's also that other, you know, the other side to it where you want to be mindful and respectful at all times of, of the things that you're doing regarding the art form, never taking it too far, I think. So, yeah, it's kind of scary in, in, in that sense. And uh, I hope to be, you know, an advisor to those who are coming up, who are following Siapo, learning how to manage it, understanding why those patterns, there's only 13 of them why those patterns were selected versus just kind of like loosely using them, that they were so meaningful to our ancestors and, and just kind of working in that capacity. 
So thank you, Vito Polon, for your question. I, I'm really happy you are here. Um, uh, yeah, I was one of those children observing uh, women when they were getting together and applying henna to their bodies and knowing their personal stories and how um, they were dealing, um, you know, women, especially in Middle East, they are going through so much pain and sorrow and they have all these um, barriers to speak up. And it was really a scary starting using that that technique in uh, my stereo practice publicly. But um, watching Shirin Neshat, a very famous Iranian artist, she's using the technique, not the material, but I started adding personal uh, values to it by uh, reinterpreting the stories that I saw the entire my childhood. And the very first pieces I created were the stories that I saw and the motifs that I were witness uh, that female get together and uh, design and draw on each other's palms and uh, fits. Uh, and I created my own ritual, how to mix um, the henna with uh, different oils that I'm getting uh, while I'm traveling around the world to add more meaning and depth to um, the pieces that I'm uh, putting together. Thanks again. <laughs> Great. Um, another question for Regina. What yes. are the most important differences between Siapo and Hawaiian tapa? It's the process of making u'a, I would say, because the Hawaiian kapa makers have a different method for beating their, their u'a. And Samoan Siapo makers, we have a different process. And you'll find that pretty much straight across the board between Tongan Matsu, Fiji and Masi, Mahute from Rapa Nui. There's, there's really different methods, but what's really the tying thread there is the actual paper mulberry. We have different patterns, but there will be some similarities in their appearance. And it's so great when we get together and we share differences and it's just really a wonderful camaraderie that we have between, uh, between islands, but Pacific islands. Uh, I have a high regard for the kapa makers, beautiful work. And I think they have one ply where siapo makers, when they like to do their siapo tsusinga, like the one behind me, we do two plies. So we have this, uh, we, we lay, we place the layers of the bark cloth perpendicular. So there's real strength to them and because we'll wear them, et cetera. And uh, I think the Hawaiian copper makers focus on a one ply and they also do indent where they, I'm sorry, they do stamp, stamping with uh, uh, a particular um, carved piece that they use. And we'll use the, like the board here that you see LA to do our rubbing. So there's a little bit of differences, but Overall, the similarity is that we we honor the, the natural canvas, which is the paper mulberry. Right. Sude, um, this is a, another uh, question from Fida. Uh, I'm impressed with this new direction <laughs> in your work. Are you making these dresses for specific friends or to reflect specific experiences? Would you consider making them fit your body and would you consider wearing one to your exhibition? If so, how would this be different than displaying them in the formal manner? So um, the year 2020 was very hard year for Iranians, especially. And then, you know, all the word after the pandemic happened. I just started uh, working on the pieces uh, related to the sorrow morning, public morning and the power of the healing. Of course, I always am um, looking as our body as like as a canvas maybe. And when we are covering it with uh, meaningful dresses or clothing that we are creating, um, that is uh, adding more uh, value to the piece that I'm creating. So um, the recent uh, talismatic shirts, they are having uh, names and the stories of the deceased people and the people who, um, brutally killed after the plane crash in January 8 by Iranian regime and government and uh, 176 people died and uh, many of them were women and kids. 
um, just writing their stories, adding their names and sewing them with the hair uh, pieces that I'm getting as a donation from my friends and my loved ones and wearing that uh, costume myself, it is kind of part of my ritual to keep their names alive and to leave their stories, unfinished stories. And hopefully at the end, like I, when, when I have enough of these talismatic shirts, I um, start uh, putting together a show, asking people to wear those because we as the people who are, have the privilege to live in a free world, you know, uh, we can uh, continue telling their stories, their names and um, having a tribute to them. Thanks for the question again, Rita. Um, Regina, I've got two for you. Um, Kathy J says, a beautiful presentation and asks, how resilient are Siapu in relation to environmental conditions? What are the ideal conditions for their preservation? <laughs> Thank you for the question. That's a very good one. If we're talking museum, it's wonderful how museums across the world who have a collection of Siapu and Tapa in general, how they maintain and manage their bark cloth, which is lovely. I mean, the conditions are perfect, right? We have the perfect temperature and things are, you know, in, encased beautifully. Here in American Samoa or in the Samoan islands, one of the things that we have to do is get them to air out. We take them to air out. Now, in regards to storage, many families, honestly, we store them between the bed mattress because it keeps them flat. It keeps them out of like the in environment, the air, and you have to take them out to get them to, to get the sun to, to you know, whatever. If they have a, a musty smell to them, you, you air them out. Same thing with our fine mats. And that's pretty much the way we handle them. In addition, you know, like some people are like, what, this is what you guys do? Sometimes if there's an older siapo, they'll use it for the backing of a new one. And it's just that recycling that our siapo makers have always done and it might be unthought of or unheard of in you know, other standards, but it is one of the things, one of the practices that we, we do here. And so you know, we wanna maintain it as best as possible. So storing them in that capacity is really key for us because we live in a very humid environment. It's very rainy here often. And so you have to always take a look at your material culture, making sure that they're still, they're still standing, withstanding the test of time. Uh, and to add on to that, um, is there a written record of the meanings of the Samoan motifs? Yes, there is. You can actually go to a couple of Auntie Mary's book. I believe it's out of print. She has her motifs. I know she mentions that there's nine Siapo Mamanu motifs. And the Fa'angongo, which is the bird. Uh, there's the Fa'angongo bird. There's the Fa'atuli, which is a smaller bird. And then the Fa'avaituli, which is the footprints of the bird. She condenses it as being one motif. And when I say that there's you know, more than nine, it's because I separate them and identify them you know, with respect as being one you know, individual. There's a couple of places. There's, uh, you can go to siapo.com. That's a family website. And uh, we have uh, a couple of different books, I believe, that will showcase some of the art forms. I know there's other things online. What happens is though, oftentimes some of the patterns get fused in with the Tao, which is the tattoo, the Samoan traditional tattoo. And even though there's this beautiful continuity between the two, there's also differences. I know the most current book right now, which is a real keeper and one to have in your collection is called Tapa. It's the most current and concise of the books that have a wide range of bark cloth production straight across uh, the Pacific and beyond. And Michel Charlou, who was coordinated, uh, who coordinated the TAPA conference in Tahiti, I believe that was 2015, condensed all these papers. And I believe you can find some of that information if someone's looking for that in that book as well. That's great. I don't see any more questions. Um... We've got some time if anyone has additional questions or if any of you guys have uh, panelists, if you have further comments you'd like to make, something you 
want to touch on before we so I can, I can continue a little bit. <laughs> sure. Um, I am uh, trying, I am curating shows uh, as very important part of my uh, studio practice. And my current uh, project is a project after the pandemic I started is uh, called Drawn Together. And everyone can check that on uh, my Instagram account, ongoingconversation.art. I encourage uh, artists from around the world uh, to send me the mailing addresses and they receive a piece of fabric uh, with a printed uh, stamps on it. So they add the uh, experience in any shape, any technique they want on that uh, fabric. And um, the final pieces will collect uh, and uh, Patch to each other and they will travel around the world. I already have a couple of galleries uh, booked in uh, different countries around the world. And by today, I have 400 plus artists from uh, 16 countries around the world participated in the project. I would love to have some of uh, the Textile Society of America's uh, people and uh, community members to join. Uh, because I think we all together can uh, deliver much more a stronger message. And uh, I'm definitely looking forward to receive uh, more uh, emails. And uh, they can go through uh, the Instagram pages and there are all the information uh, in the posts. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. That sounds really like an exciting project. There is one more question. Um, and Mary Connors is noting that your dress style looks very Chinese. Um, does it also relate to historical Iranian costume? Uh, they are actually, the stylists uh, belong to the Safavid era in Iran. They look similar. And um, one thing that I struggle a lot, being a Persian carpet weaver myself, and studying that uh, and uh, having the concentration on antique textile uh, restoration, uh, the, the forms and shapes are repeating. Like, um, we, uh, still, like lots of historians are fighting if the Pazuric carpet is belong to Iran or Turkey or where around the world, or because you find in Siberia, maybe it's from Siberia. So I believe um, there is no limits when it comes to the art and the forms are very similar when you go uh, through the kings and uh, important people's outfits uh, in Iranian, Turkish, Chinese, even uh, Turkmen's uh, like customs. So they look very similar. And I, I noticed that. Thank you for asking it. <laughs> and I think that that's all our questions. Any last comments from any panelists? Um, Zeynep or Regina or Sude? I just have one last comment. I'm, I'm so grateful. Thank you so much for, for this opportunity. It's my first time and I just really appreciate hearing and seeing and experiencing so much here. It's a, a real eye opener and I really appreciate the work that goes on beyond our shores. Um, I, hope that, uh, I hope that we can meet in person one day. That would be so lovely. And I just wanna yes. wish everybody all the best and you know, safety. And if you are interested in a mask, let me know. <laughs> and some of our current work right now is uh, with the University of Glasgow, and they have a website, tapa.gla.ac.uk. I put it in my paper. But anyway, there will be some footage on how to do this and some of the patterns as well, if anyone's interested in knowing more. But I also recommend just come on down to American Samoa. You'll have a place <laughs> to learn how to do all these things. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you. He really opened our eyes to Siapo. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. Oh, maybe there's one more question. Oh, great session. Everyone's, uh, all, the, all the love's coming in. <laughs> thank you all panelists. You've done a wonderful job. And thank you all attendees for uh, being here at this session. Um, we'll close out a little early. Go get another cup of coffee before we head to our next, I think there's a 3.45 is our next session. Um, uh, section 11. I appreciate. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much.